That's wow. original. Wow. Wow. So I'll be I'll be discussing this one for a bit. Good. Uh, that's uh, yeah. I got this from family because they didn't really want it. Cool. So and I think it's one of the better things he's made, to be honest. Oh, wow. But still, it's uh, yeah. And I got some other small. So, things. Oh yeah. Yeah. So apparently we're already online for okay, a well, couple of seconds cool. now. Yeah. That's cool. Well, that's that's what happens. It's fine. We've got to behave ourselves from now on. That's yeah, exactly. Though, so, you know. <laughs> so let's start properly. Um, and um, I'll just say a couple of words in Portuguese first, and then I'll introduce you uh, properly in English. Okay. Uh, but thank you so much, Ilia, for being here today. Um, boa tarde a todos uh, que nos seguem no canal YouTube do MUNAC, do Museu Nacional de História Natural e da Ciência da Universidade de Lisboa. Um, espero que, se, uh, que seja uma, um excelente seminário e que muitos possam participar. Não se esqueçam de deixar as vossas questões ou as vossas dúvidas uh, nos comentários aqui em baixo ou aqui de lado, uh, em português ou em inglês ou em qualquer língua que nós traduzimos para o Ilia, portanto estejam perfeitamente à vontade para colocar questões e não se esqueçam de subscrever o canal do YouTube. Um, uhum. Nós vamos um, passar, uh, vou passar então a apresentar o Ilia. Um, hi Ilia, Ilia Neuland is um, a great scholar and a, a a friend uh, for many, many years now, actually. Uh, we've met uh, often in uh, many conferences on the history of natural history, which is also a passion of Ilias, and he's specialized uh, in uh, paleo, paleontolo history of paleontolo pa paleontology, history of paleontology. And um, and he, uh, I should also point out that he's just authored a brilliant book uh, stemming from his research done for his PhD on um, on the dinosaur, on the dip Diplodocus. The Diplodocus dinosaur. <laughs> it's called American Dinosaur Abroad. And please do check out in the comment section. Uh, we have all the links for uh, other uh, pieces of um, Ilya's fantastic and, and amazing work. Um, he's also done um, a lot of work on uh, paleo art and visual depictions of dinosaurs and visual representations of dinosaurs and how important they are for uh, the development of the discipline itself uh, during the 19th century and the 20th century. And today he's also going to tantalize us with uh, some bits and pieces of uh, visual history uh, produced by Otto Jekyll. Uh, Ilya is uh, at the moment writing a biography of Otto Jekyll and uh, we hope this seminar is also an opportunity to discuss uh, how biographies uh, can be written and what, what is uh, exactly, what do we want from this um, historiographical uh, format. So without further ado, uh, I give you Ilya Neuland from the Freie Universität of Amsterdam who changed his title a little bit for today, yeah. uh, but we're looking forward to his uh, seminar on the professor's artistic voice. The floor is yours, Ilya. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to set a clock here. Just to say, make, make sure that you still get to dinner time um, <laughs> without me blabbering on for all the time. Thank you uh, for inviting me, Kat Katharina. Um, I'm um, very glad to be able to present this. This is a bit of new work that I'm doing at the moment. It is. Uh, it will come across a bit work in progress, but it's based on motifs that I've been trying to developed for a longer period uh, for the biography of Otto Jekyll that I'm writing at the moment. Uh, you will ask, of course, who the who was Otto Jekyll, and I'll be sure to enlighten you by the end of the 35-ish minutes that I'm thinking we're going to take here. But what I'm really going to talk about and want to talk about is how we can use other than textual sources to amend a biographical story. So I'm not here, in this case, I'm talking about art, uh, about specifically a scientist's artwork and how it relates to the rest of his life and his scientific life. But we can also make the same comparison, for instance, with objects in collections. We can uh, look at uh, other uh, ego documents that don't include uh, correspondence that usually we might not be that aware of in uh, a, bio bi a biographer's life. Um, but let me start, let me begin with on the, at the beginning, uh, and I want to take you back to the uh, 6th of April 1906, uh, really the 5th when 
Vesuvius, Mount Vesuvius near Naples erupted in one of its rather vicious usual um, 20 years, every 20 years, years eruptions uh, that were in a very active period of the volcano uh, in an eruption that caused great devastation in the immediate surrounding of the Bay of Naples, uh, especially in uh, towns such as uh, Bosco Tricase uh, and a couple of other towns that were virtually annihilated. Uh, some of them haven't been rebuilt since. Um, and this caused the German journal, the Umschau, to send a couple of people to witness this event uh, themselves a couple of days, like a week later. Um, one of those was Otto Jekyll, uh, a German paleontologist and geologist at that time, still attached to the Natural History Museum in Berlin, but on a longish hiatus to produce uh, paintings for the Deutsche Museum in Munich. I'll come back to those later on. And th what is interesting about this is that rather than producing photographs in the journal, the Umschau was a popular science journal, uh, as you can see from the title on to the lower right. Jekyll chose to paint several scenes that he encountered. Some of them were reproduced in color. This is the first one. This shows the uh, one of the following eruptions on uh, the 16th of April, which Jekyll witnessed himself. The big cloud um, he reproduced as well. As, so, along with certain other geologically interesting features, so uh, such as the pyroclastic clouds that the mountain emanated in the days following the big eruptions. Here we see another one, and this is the this one he reproduced using photographs, but of course, being in the surrounding, he could get the colors right and the impression that the initial Plinian uh, eruption caused. However, interestingly, is that he didn't just restrict himself to scientific information. On the other, on the, quite on the contrary, he devoted attention to the devastation that the volca volcanic eruption caused as well, especially in the town surrounding it. Some photos that we saw, and this was, for instance, in the in the in the town of Ottojano, which, to my knowledge, hasn't been rebuilt since, uh, which became sort of a focal point for all the attention devoted to the horrors of the volcanic eruption at the time. And you have to say see that a this was briefly after the deadly eruption of uh, Montagne Pelé uh, on um, not Guadeloupe, the other one, Martinique, which caused the death of around twenty thousand people, and on the one hand, this just uh, was followed not soon after by the big earthquake in San Francisco. So this was an era in which these sort of events were really, really in the public's mind. Um, so this is the last uh, also color picture, which really shows uh, the general impression of devastation that uh, Jekyll was trying to convey in his paintings. Now, the use of paintings themselves was as we should say, slightly controversial at the time. And he got, Jekyll really got chided by some people for handling this report this way because what scientists obviously wanted was much more exact information rather than impressions. Now, who was Otto Jekyll? Otto Jekyll was born in 1863, was the seventh son, uh, the seventh child uh, and the last child of uh, an architect, lower middle-class family in the Prussian province of Silesia, which is today Southwestern Poland. Um, he soon started an interest in geology and paleontology, started his own geological collection, and really went the usual route for a talented student at the time. So he started at the University of Breslau, today's Wrocław, um, followed by studies with the most senior German paleontologist of the time, Karl von Zittel in Munich, then went to Strasbourg for a while and ended up, uh, or not ended up, but continued to the Natural History Museum, Museum von Naturkunde in Berlin, um, of, and particularly the Paleontological Museum, which was one of the three museums that ha was housed in the Museum von Naturkunde. Um, he, then, then his career chase takes something of um, yeah, an unlucky break in the sense that he gets into conflict with two of two successive directors of the Paleontological Museum and is sort of promoted far away to the University of Greifswald uh, in northern Germany. 
Now, Graz was a really nice town, but it's also very, very far away from Berlin, which Jekyll didn't really like for a number of reasons. One of them being that the pay was a lot worse and that he was much farther away from places like Naples. The other one was that he could not visit Berlin galleries any longer. He, he, Graswold had really limited uh, artistic life compared to Berlin, uh, particularly. Um, he took place, uh, well, probably the most famous, he's most famous for um, initiating and coordinating the excavation of uh, a large number of dinosaurs in uh, the Sax Saxonian city of Halbstadt, particularly Plateosaurus, which he supervised from 1908-ish until 1922. Uh, and this is, we see him here in the center of the, uh, of the excavation. Um, this is a picture of him as a newly appointed professor at the Museum von Naturkunde in 1905. And here we see him preparing the fossil of Plateosaurus. Now this is, um, he will already go get, get into the his reputation for being something of a dilettante, but we'll get back to that later on. In the First World War, he served as a captain in the Prussian army uh, and was wounded almost in the first instance, in the first days of the war, spent most of the time in Bruges in Belgium, trying to revive the excavations of the dinosaur Iguanodon in the dig in in the Belgian uh, town of Bernissar, which almost succeeded. They started digging in, um, again in November of 1918, and then the armistice happened and they all had to uh, make themselves scarce. Throughout his life, Jekyll um, contacted and was part of a large group of artists. We're talking about, um, uh, already, already showed you a drawing made of him in 1896 by the, uh, at that time, quite famous artist, Paul Hermann. This is a bust made of him in Italy, actually, uh, by the sculptor Italo Campagnolo in 1904. And we have all sorts of various uh, depictions of Jekyll by befriended artists. There is one very significant artist that was a friend of his, Eugen Bracht, a symbol of, or a naturalist German painter of the time. Um, which will play, who will play a, a rather big role in this story. But it was this whole problem, the problem that most of the scientific community saw with Jekyll's work had to do with being on this, his, his attitude towards um, the use of art as part of science or rather as an extension of his scientific activity or even the other way around science as an extinction of its artistic activity. Here we see a photograph of Jekyll in China in 1929. It has been colorized afterwards. Uh, and the quote is, uh, and it, he died in China of about six months after his arrival. He was supposed to take up uh, a new professor's post in Guangzhou, which he did, but he died shortly after, just after getting pneumonia at a paleontological conference in Peking. Of Beijing, sorry. Um, and this is a, uh, a, an obituary written um, by the Frankfurt paleontology Fritz Revemann in 1929, which also shows him, uh, shows this ambivalent attitude. He, sell, he tells that Jekyll, as an able scientist, but also as he, well, the most relevant part is, isn't that a picture full of light? Who can demand with so much light the shadows? And the shadows, obviously, his work as an artist and not being the, the kind of scientist that was primarily focusing on certainty, which was really um, in, in the whole German scientific epistemology, one of the most highly rated values. Isn't that who can demand that with so much light the shadows should not be missing? Uh, nobody, because sisters, uh, uh, I said, sisters are, sisters are light. Um, something similar can be seen a couple of years later when the, uh, the, the, the paleontologist or the paleobotanist Robert Pont Potonier writes about um, the artwork performed by paleontologists, which by that time, and we've talked in 1948, has become a little less uh, of a hot issue than it was before. But he's still critical about uh, Jekyll in a certain way. 
said these show, pictures show how the author might have become an able painter. He ruthlessly, ruthlessly yet sensitively brought out the exceptional colors accompanying the outbreak. And he's sometimes inhibited by the pursuit of scientifically accurate form. Now, scientifically accurate obviously is the top value that should be uh, pursued by any scientist in both uh, Dreyfermans and Potonier's and other people's form. Now, Jekyll doesn't really have a lot to say about his own art and a real relation to science, but he does at one point in 1910 when he um, contributes an article to the Myers Conversations Lexicon Encyclopedia, and here he says, um, and I've got to move someone around because all these little windows in Zoom sort of uh, make a break here. Uh, reconstruction is at the same time an artistic work, and those who have no feeling for the organic and harmonic flow of lines should not even attempt to give flesh, skin, color to these skeletons. And that is, I think, a really important motivation for himself. He thinks that actually being able to artistically approach these subject matters in a field like paleontology, where there's so much uncertainty, where you so there, there is no, you cannot have uh, absolute certainty or accuracy. Or you, and, and to pursue it, in Jekyll's view, is uh, chasing a dream that will never uh, come to pass. Here we see uh, Otto Jekyll painting in uh, 1928 in Gangzhou. Um, and this is sort of one of the few images that we have of him actually pursuing in this uh, in this activity. His first, uh, he's, he started painting already in his early youth. His, he, here we have his first picture that's actually survived as a as a uh, as a teen, uh, probably 1880, probably a, a bit uh, before that. And we can see the ancestral home, which uh, which is still exists in in Poland, by the way. Um, but most of what he writes, what he, most of what he paints is done on postcards. So he will make quick impressions of uh, his surroundings on a postcard, usually watercolors or, or uh, clay or chalk drawings, and just to send to people. So for that reason, of his quite astonishingly large output as an artist, very little has actually been preserved of these postcards because they were casual objects and not things meant to be uh, preserved indefinitely. And usually this, these drawings are very quickly done. It's really to give, it's really an impressionist's uh, approach. Uh, the, in, the, the use of color is really interesting. We'll get to that. There's a really concrete reason why it is that form. This is one of them. Uh, I just included it because it is of uh, the Lisbon. Uh, I could only think that it, it must be somewhere along the Teju uh, or out out at sea, uh, and of to uh, of to sailboats, and usually the uh, you have to imagine that these are also postcard sized, and sometimes when he got the, imp the inclination, he elaborated these into much more extensive artworks, such as these this one which he uh, gave to his uh, son as a graduation party, uh, a graduation gift. Uh, there's not a lot of pot portrait in his work. This uh, portrait of his wife uh, during their honeymoon is um, understandably sensitive, uh, but he wasn't really a great portraitist. He's also, uh, and also he's, he's a self-taught man and, and also one of very great energy and of, if you're very honest, of limited ability. Uh, but he, this energy, energy compensated for a lot of that, uh, for shortcomings, I think. And then also there's humor. Uh, this is a reconstruction of two um, instances of uh, two, two uh, diplodocuses, which of course I was very in interesting to me, uh, which he calls a shad spilt, uh, a, a sort of comical image uh, in which he tried to symbolize the battle that was going on at that time about how diplodocus had actually moved about between German and American scientists. And then there's endless doodles and drawings and um, in the in the margins of papers that he corrected or uh, print proofs that he went through, and usually they're not as extensive as this, but sometimes they are, and they're really interesting also to make up his the, the, the things that he was talking about here. This is actually in the uh, at the probably in at the side of a proof, which sort of leads me to believe that he wasn't particularly interested in this bit of printed uh, printed matter if he took so much time to make create. A, a drawing. 
And finally, what I want to get into is his education, what, what you would call his educational work, most of which he made at Greifswald University. So these are actually educational pieces, although they are also works of art, they're educational pieces, mainly meant for students to study the cliffs of uh, Rügen Island, uh, the big, the largest German island just to the coast, uh, the north, uh, north of the mainland. And uh, these are actually used until uh, just up to today, because they show very much, very well how these coasts, the, which are mainly uh, uh, clay, uh, or mainly uh, chalk, uh, chalk uh, coasts um, and limestone, have developed since Jekyll's day more than a hundred years ago. So they're very instructive for geology students just to see how the elements uh, influence the shape of these coasts and the vegetation. So this is a um, this is one of these pieces that shows the cliffs of Rugen Island. Uh, and here is probably his most impressive piece. And this is um, uh, an overview of the coast of uh, Rugen from the German mainland. Uh, the actual thing uh, is, I think, about eight meters wide and a meter and a half in height. Uh, and it's one of the, he, he painted this for the new, for a new, uh, um, Geological Museum at the University of Kreisfeld. Now, this is one uh, that is in my that I have. I actually want to study a bit further just to see how this comes into um, writing a biography of a person like this. This is a um, drawing made of a church in Kreisfeld, um, and this has uh, this is one that I actually have myself. Uh, and this is a really good illustration of how you can even get some uh, the, the, how these artworks even produce uh, peripheral information that can be useful to you later. <clears throat> and the reason that I say that is that if you look, I mean, the church still exists, although it looks a bit different today after it, there was a fire in the 1950s and they rebuilt it in a, in a slightly different fashion. But um, you can quite determine uh, you can determine very well uh, what the vantage point is that the painter took at this at this time, and I've actually sort of recreated this. Uh, and the interesting bit here is that we see to the lower right of this picture, we see the University of Greifswald, which actually the building that Jekyll worked in, and he lived in a house on um, the top left, which you can't just can't see. So it's actually you can make an inference about how how you, in how he went to work. He actually took his painting gear with him when he went from home to work and from back back, to back home at the end of the day. So the, and this is a bit of an inference because he might have just done that on one occasion, but it shows the way in which someone looks around him into the world, always in an with an opportunity at looking at, uh, at these uh, things that he might perceive conceivably turn into artworks. And one of the most concrete uh, elements is also that he usually dates these works, especially the postcards by days. You can actually make a very good, uh, have, you can have a very good idea of what and where he studied at what any given at any given point in time. Uh, I want to go into two big influences into his artwork, both of which are again um, important to see where art comes into science. science um, and I'm going to close up with one case study of. Uh, how we can instrumentalize this to better study someone's life. Um, I would have mentioned two big influences. The one is a very good friend of his, uh, although a somewhat older man, the painter Eugen Bracht, uh, someone who got famous by painting this sort of stuff, uh, really sought after artists, really rich artists as well, uh, by valued by mostly the upper uh, middle classes, the civilian, the burgerliche, um, uh, uh, the, the burgerliche classes. Um, he also was very well known for painting this sort of material. So he was a very naturalist, almost Alma Tadema-like reality to it, although it never gets quite that that fine as someone like Alma Tadema does. Uh, later in his life, he turns to a more impressionist and more more social commentary uh, as this picture of the um, Hirsch Stahl uh, of steel factory reveals. So this is very much impressing upon the viewer how that that maybe, um, and especially in Germany in 1907, you have to see there's a sort of general optimism about the role of industry. So this 
this optimism is really reflected here. Um, so Bracht really in, influenced Jekyll in Jekyll's art in a lot of ways. He, Jekyll knew Bracht, he revered him to some extent, although later they became more personal, more intimate. Um, but he was really impressed by the fact that he actually knew this guy. So a very famous painter. And uh, you see some elements being copied in Jekyll's own work, like the choice of subject. But it would be unfair, I think, to, uh, sorry, that was a bit brief. It would be unfair to, to, to quote this as a case of a one-sided relationship, because you see, for, for instance, that Bracht begins to choose paleontological subject matter. So this is a reconstruction. Uh, it's called the Tremendous One of Primeval Times, Gewaltige Urzeit, and it's a reconstruction of the Irish elk, the extinct deer, Megaloceros. Um, which for a number of reasons is something that Jekyll would have brought to uh, Bracht's attention. And again, you can also see that in some compositions, you can, Bracht, especially in his later years, uses motifs that have been developed by Jekyll. For instance, this is a really good example where really the whole composition of an image, the skewed horizon, um, is adapted from a much earlier painting uh, by Jekyll himself. So there is a bit of reciprocity in this whole relationship that only always gets uh, overlooked. Another very important um, influence is what we call uki, uh, ukiyo-e, which is traditional uh, Japanese woodblock printing. Jekyll was a, a passionate uh, collector of Japanese art in a time that, that wasn't really very usual. So he was also able to buy a lot of uh, prints on a, for a really decent price. And he amassed a, a very esteemed collection, which he had to sell for financial reasons in the early 1920s. But up until that, that point was seen as one of the best collections in Germany. It was actually used in a number of uh, exhibits. And if we look at, for instance, um, the work of uh, Kashushika Hokusai in um, and we compare that to some of Jekyll's compositions. We can see a very clear simile, simile here. Here in the in the, the uh, avoidance of depth, it's a very flat, uh, admittedly a very flat picture where most of the action takes place in the lower in the, in the upper half. But also, for instance, in the use of very prominent element in the foreground and the so the scenery itself serving as the background on an image, which we can see here in a very stylized depiction of the Rugen cliffs. And again, also the way in which it is stylized is very reminiscent of some elements of ukiyo-e, as we can see here. How does this play in to Jekyll's science, you might ask? Well, in a number of ways. Uh, and I want to give you one example that I've been working on recently, which I think illustrates this better than anything else. So, you're probably thinking, why are we all to dinosaurs? Well, this isn't a dinosaur. This is the animal uh, Demetrodon, uh, which traditionally was called um, a, um, let me see how much time I have. Oh, gonna, easy. Um, which initially was called a mammal-like reptile, which would now call a synapsid um, or, a, or a stem reptile. And this was an animal that was is considered to be one of our own ancestors from the early Permian, so around 250, 260 million years ago, and then, uh, which was discovered in the late 1870s by Edward Drinker Cope, one of the famous uh, American paleontologists, who reconstructed it as, well, something of a, of a prehistoric sailboat, basically. And the problem is that uh, the metrodon exists and was a really, um, it is still considered to be a really important uh, fossil. Uh, but there was also, they also found another animal, which they called Neosaurus. And in hindsight, it turns out that Neosaurus was constructed of Dimetrodon's body, of uh, skull, sorry, Dimetrodon's skull, and the body of an entirely different animal. But Neosaurus got recognized in paleontological literature. So this misunderstanding lasted for quite a time. Uh, Neosaurus was reconstructed in the, initially in the 1890s by Charles Knight with a sort of very arch domed um, skull. And then again, 
uh, in a slightly varied form in 1906, uh, we see Charles Knight working on the Neosaurus model here. Uh, this was a, part, a companion piece to an article, a big article in um, uh, Scientific American devoted to Neosaurus, which then got turned into a, a sort of commercial model, which was handed out to museums. Now to the upper left, we see the model that ne Otto Jekyll bought himself from the American Museum of Natural History. And to the lower right, we see how that original model looks today after they've amended the skull. So they took a, they've taken off the wrong skull and or maybe, yeah, basically they've taken off the skull and sort of freeze it to get back to something that actually was more deemed more scientifically accurate. Jekyll, on the other hand, before this all happened, had been working on Neosaurus himself. And he sort of contested the view that these elongated spines that you see here were connected by a sail, like we think today. Sort of sail, I have to say, which is often considered to have played some role in the, in the animal uh, thermal or, or the, 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 uh, the way in which the animal kept control of its own body temperature. Uh, which is sort of reinforced by the fact that some other animals who don't really related to Neosaurus or Dimetrodon have the same the same sort of structures. And he and this is sort of a sort of party piece at a geological society conference. It's it's a two page article, and here he shows how Neosaurus could have used these spines not as a form of a sail, but rather as sort of porcupine as he he. he he actually calls it a fossil porcupine uh, and, and sort of uh, tries to intimidate all sorts of predators with it. He, a couple of years later, he finds the remains of what he thinks is Neosaurus in the Saxony, Saxonian uh, town of uh, Freistadt. And he thinks that and now he's got a really good reason to put this into a major article and also to develop some more of his thoughts about it, because instead of have just having to riff on an American theme, he actually has to have some sort of make some sort of sense of an animal that is now a German animal. I can, there are all sorts of similes with that, but I won't go into that at the time. Um, there, there are some other reconstructions that have never been published as the one to the lower right. And this again shows how um, Jekyll engaged another artist, Mark Rudloff, who unfortunately died before the uh, drawing could be published. And try, you can clearly see that he was inspired by Rudloff's painting, which we see to the lower right, to produce his own one. And I, I, I think that the reason he actually didn't use that exact painting was simply because all the, the spines are too vertical. He wants them to have to place in different angles just to show how you can point them towards a possible uh, threat. At the same time, he's working, Jekyll is working at the Deutsche Museum in Munich to produce some paintings for the new exhibit. Now, this is a very prestigious uh, undertaking. And it again brings him into contact with all sorts of other artists that he has to employ or has to engage to produce other artistic material for, uh, or other art material for the uh, museum. Um, and, and so, and that, also involves some other people who are working with him on Neosaurus. So you already can see these various worlds mingling that he, he uses artists to develop his thoughts on fossils and he uses these fossils to engage artists to work together with him. Now, this really comes to a head in 1913 when the new Berlin uh, Aquarium is opened. And among uh, the, the aquarium is actually known for um, a number of reconstructions that are slightly odd. You can see Triceratops here in the middle in a sort of a hunchback a reptilian position, which was a sort of a battle going on between uh, various sections of the, of, the, of the German paleontological community and between German and American paleontologists at the time. And one of the depictions that you see here, again, to the top right of the picture is this one. It's called Idaphosaurus, and it probably originally said uh, Neosaurus or Dimetrodon. And this is a, a particularly um, Jekyllian uh, Dimetrodon, 
or Edaphosaurus or Neosaurus or whatever you'd like to call it, because it does lack the sail that we habitually and certainly at this time would have found in any reconstruction of Edaphosaurus. Now, this is the original drawing that we see. And if we look at both of these, we can already discern how uh, the artist that produced these images, Heinrich Harder, came to this reconstruction. So how can we see how Jekyll made his influence felt here in these reconstructions? There are no direct textual sources to make this link, but there are a couple of elements which make it likely. The first is the use of ukiyo-e as a Japanese woodblock art, as you can see even more in the lower picture than in the top one, where we have very expressive uh, bright colors being used. The image, there is no real attempt to create any depth in the image. And it's really, really stylized, even more than the one on top. Of course, we have to make some amend amends for the fact that we have to do with tiles on the lower image. So that places technical restrictions. But we can still see very clear influence of Japanese woodblock art here. Then there's Eugen Bracht. The fact uh, Bracht, as I said, was a friend of Jekyll, but he was also um, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, supervisor for uh, Heinrich Harder who produced these images. So there we have a direct personal link there. Then we have location. Harder, the, the artist that produced this Neosaurus on the front of the Berlin Aquarium, lived in Putza in, um, or his family lived in Putza and he regularly visited uh, his family. Jekyll regularly received artists and scholars who wanted to see his collection of Japanese drawings. So you can easily devise a, a schedule where Harder is able to visit Jekyll in his collection in person. And then finally, it's the direct link is of course that Harder here depicts an image that is only represented in the literature by Jekyll's thoughts. So we can have, we have four factors here that sort of together create a likely scenario and an image where art is actually employed um, to further scientific views and scientific views are used to further art. Now to close off, what does this say about what Lorraine Destin has say, said as, as um, a, a, the scientific persona? Uh, and the scientific persona is, uh, I've, I've picked up the, the, the uh, definition here, an intermediate between individual biography and social institutions. So basically someone who represents the epistemological values of a certain discipline. Um, or as you say here, creates a collective with a shared and recognizable physiognom physiognomy or a way to behave and act and express themselves. Now, well, I think here we are at the root why his contemporaries were so uneasy with Jekyll, his way of working, his way of, of dealing with art. Uh, for instance, in the case of the Naples ex uh, eruption. Um, so I think that a, a scientific life uh, can, can be assessed by more than uh, by explaining other personas than just the scientific one. Here we have someone who isn't, who, who doesn't really present such a un, unified, uh, unified image of what an ideal German scientist at the time tried to be, but instead makes several things to one another's benefit. Um, so, and because that self-definition in the case of Jekyll was not universal, uniform, you see that that creates a very great deal of unease among his colleagues because it's very difficult to place him. In addition, I have to say he performed other roles. He wrote about history, art history, and all loads of things. But what it comes down to is that F, that that what can what this sort of sources can help us with is to get a more complex image of a biographical subject, but also. They, I think they're invaluable in placing such a subject um, within its society and, and, and also to distinguish him between his colleagues and also to distinguish him from their own self-image, which of course was really sort of conventional. But then we look out for this guy and it's very unconventional. So I know it's a bit all over the place and it's sort of a setup for what I have to write about it. And I want to thank you for listening to me. 
And also I want to thank you for potentially for helping me to develop these ideas. So um, that's all that I have to talk about for now. Oh, thank you so much, Ilya. This was a fascinating um, intermediary sort of uh, interstitial uh, knowledge that we can get from um, to complete, uh, that's the aim, to complete the figure of, of our biographies. So uh, thank you. Thank you also um, for this conclusion, because it was just so well uh, drafted how we could see uh, via this now Saros uh, case study how it actually played this uh, connection between visual mm -hmm. depiction and representation and all the tools that he Yekel actually mastered uh, in order to distinguish between different representations uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, of aesthetically uh, representations but also um, this this reflection about the cultural, the shared cultural values of what it means to be a scientist in a specific discipline. And I think this is absolutely um, fantastic. Um, so, oh, I have a lot of questions, uh, but uh, I'm going to, to, sorry, I'm going to uh, start by... Um, clarifying or sort of uh, ordering a point of clarification about uh, Yekel's stay in Lisbon because uh, we really want to know more about that or rather we would like to uh, to know if you I have just... any any other um, details that you may have gotten from his for example did he visit the museum or the geological museum at the Com geological commission for example yeah that's that's sort of I haven't really gone into Portuguese sources just, just yet. Mm -hmm. At the time, he worked at the Museum von der Token in Berlin, the National mm -hmm. Rescue Museum, and his usual task, among his usual tasks, was the acquisition of new material for the museum. So this is in 1904. He would already been deep in conflict with uh, Wilhelm von Branca, which was the director of the museum. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of those cases of conflicting personalities because they are so alike. In a lot of yeah. in a lot of respects, but Branca, of course, had was a senior party and had the upper hand in a lot of lot of other ways. Um, so in March of 1904, it, I, I think it's more most conceivable. I, he would certainly have visited these museums if they were mm. accessible. So yeah, um, I think it's most conceivable at least that he arranged to meet with a colleague. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what he usually did. It's also yeah. the way in which these scientists, uh, especially paleontologists, because it was such a, a small community, they tended to seek each other out. So mm -hmm. it's conceivable. Uh, in 1902, there was the big uh, zoological conference in oh. Berlin, which mm -hmm. was partly organized by Jekyll. And he personally received a couple of Portuguese scholars, um, probably at his home. Because he lived in a really big house in uh, south in Steglitz in, in south mm -hmm. uh, at the time, um, and and yeah, it usually yeah, then, if they mm. if, you know hotels were a yeah. luxury thing, so uh, sure. scholars would usually live with one another. I mean, visit one another and stay with one mm. another. And That's Jekyll exciting. was actually yeah. known for inviting all sorts of people without actually telling his wife. So they were perennially <laughs> short of money because they spent everything on lavish lavish dinners for colleagues and friends and so forth. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know is the, is yeah. the, is the short answer, uh, but I yeah. intend whenever I got the opportunity to look into that a bit more deeply and see who at this time was active in Lisbon uh, in this field. Mm. At the time. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so but then uh, the, the call is out for our colleagues at the museum to, to also mm. try and, and, and eventually help you with, with the, the search for, oh, yeah, for these uh, archival materials. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you again. This this is just such a just such an interesting um, and and original uh, feature that Jekyll was such a good draftsman and painter and and also uh, mastered all these different um, types of depictions like the mm. the flatness and the the use of empty space is really mm. striking and, and interesting or negative space rather. Um, I think I think you've got a very good sense of composition most of them or uh -huh. anything. Else. I mean I think 
um, his ability of a draftsman is limited. He's not the greatest mm -hmm. so, yeah, draftsman but... of all time, but he's very good at composition and and looking uh, and and drawing your eye to what he wants. I think this image is a really good comp a really good example where these two little boats really draw you in, um, yeah. despite there being a lot of empty space around them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, um, what 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 are your um, comment? Could you please uh, elaborate a little bit more on how um, how did it work? This sort of um, uncertain epistemological uh, way of doing paleontology um, in terms of reconstruction. So, what does it mean to actually? Um, it's not just compared anatomy, right? No, it's not no, just no, no. looking at a bone and figuring out how tall whatever it was, or if it's a herbivore or a carnivore. It's about so much more than that. And how does it actually play with the need to also sort of recreate these, not just not just environments, but like ecologies, right? Around in mm. these depictions, usually they also, um, these, these dinosaurs are also accompanied by fauna, other fauna or flora, or at least this ambiance. Mm. I think there's two things to keep in mind. One of them I mentioned, I think Jekyll had a very, like, like some of his colleagues, but not all of them. Um, he was really, the, before the time, I mean, in the 19th century, there's already really a sort of disagreement about whether you should reconstruct, make life reconstructions of these extinct animals anyway, because you can't, you don't really have the tools, you know, it's all, you have fragmentary bones, it's all speculative, it's not really what a German scientist was supposed to do. <laughs> um, so what Jekyll said, yeah, you, you can't, you shouldn't really do that, but you should only do that when you have sort of sense of proportion. We actually know how animals work, and when you actually mm -hmm. know how what what a likely reconstruction is, and and we're looking for likely degrees of like likelihood. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that Jekyll is, of course, which I didn't mention as expressly because you know, no, um, is at this time working to integrate paleontology rather much more with zoology to create a sort of paleobiology rather than just looking at anatomical features and see how this bone hinged in that bone and how it all hang, hung together anatomically, we're trying to create a fossil ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to see how a, an animal actually functioned in its surroundings and with other animals, et cetera, uh, which means that it's a, that's a very different approach than the traditional paleontological approach of just describing what it, how all these bones hung together, but not really thinking about anything else more than that. Um, and uh, so these two things, uh, the so, sort mm -hmm. of sense of proportion, sense of uh, and 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 integration with more science, these are both problematic among colleagues. Um, the first because they're too speculative and deemed too speculative by a lot of mm -hmm. colleagues. The second because obviously he was going to reform existing academic power structures. Yeah. Um, that's the problem with paleontology. They just are a little bit too late. You know, by the 1870s, 1880s, all these academic disciplines have they got their own chairs, they have yeah. their own budgets, they have their own places at the university. So here comes this paleontologist, and he was not the only one, but he was a really well known representative who wants to sort of get you unemployed as a professor <laughs> or to steal away your job or your position. So yeah gets into a situation with colleagues that make them even more unfriendly towards the motives in that case as well. And they use, they, they portray him as a dilettante also for that reason. It's simply simple popular power struggle with as well. Yeah, how how interesting. So hard hard thing to to have success in, right? Trying to mm. establish a, a brand new discipline that gets a little bit from both uh, because it already comes a little bit late in the in the autonomous uh, disciplines game so to speak mm. so I'm going to stop sharing your screen now so that uh, mm. we have like sort of a more of a dialogue here happening yeah um, yeah so and then how how does color play into this uh, so you you said you were going to um, also talk a little bit more about how how the, the the role of color because of course by this time even 
photography was already being used as a mm. scientific as a scientific tool. Um, so how what was the sort of the debate in terms of in, for for Yekel specifically uh, between using a, a for example a photographic camera or keeping with this sort of more um, impressionist take on how to capture life. Mm. Um, life is more difficult, but for instance, in the case that I began with, with the uh, volcanic eruption in Naples, mm. that was one of the three prime motivations to be able to give a more complete expression of the devastation caused and about the force of nature being, you know, about a much stronger image than um, all these photographs portrayed because it was sort of all shades of gray, you know, because you got a sort of darkish volcano and a darkish mm. cloud against a darkish background. So that, that and, and, and every, every photo you see of this event is very much um re, uh, have been retouched a lot mm. so uh, and this is this is something something that he used also to um uh one of the things that he argues against for instance is also the conservative use of color you know, when you're portraying animals because it was it, be, it became to get usual around this time to if you are reconstructing making a live reconstruction of an animal in the flesh you should mm -hmm. be as conservative as possible Mm -hmm. So that means two things. One is um, using sort of dark brown, dark gray, dark green colors, yeah. Yeah. because you never know how they yeah. what, what color they had. Mm -hmm. The other thing is what we, uh, what people in the paleo, paleo art community are still referring to as shrink wrapping. So whatever, if you portray an animal, you have to make sure that it's that distinctive physical features, so the shape important shapes of bones and so forth will be visible in the reconstruction. Of course, that's not how animals work. Yeah. You now, if you look at the, for instance, the structure of the neck of a hair that mm -hmm. has the uh, neck of a hair goes like that, uh -huh. but the neck is like that, you know? Um, so that is one of, one of the things that he argues against that you have. And that's why he refers to have a feeling for contours and for shapes and for organic forms. But of course, that's much too vague for all these mathematicians and physicists that want to measure the 100th millimeter of a copper wire yeah so that you see the, the conflict um coming from that yeah so it's really interesting because i was it, that's that's new in the discussion of paleo paleontological uh, representations or to to actually just go bold in the in the colors or am mm. i just too in a too Mm, so it, not so much, for instance, in very earliest representations. So if you look in sure. the 1850s and 1860s, they're much more impressive, uh, expressive, sorry. Mm -hmm. And then it takes off again around what people like Ely Kish um, and others do in the 1980s, in the early 1980s. And that's much more a, con um, a consequence of really new ideas about what animals might have looked like, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. a big upturn in the amount of fines and the diversity of fines. And nowadays, uh, the whole paradigm, the whole, yeah, whole idea about how to reconstruct animals in art has undergone a really rapid transformation over the last 10 years. Uh, partly because we partly can infer from fossils how what sort of colors animals might have had. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is just that, um, uh, yeah, uh, paleo artists have become, have granted themselves much more freedom to exploit the existing diversity and variety in nature and superimpose that upon a fossil past. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and although we've always known that we're dealing in, uh, as I said, degrees of unlikely and likelihood um, instead of instead of uh, considering that to be a problem artists are beginning now to embrace it because mm. it also gives them a sort of leeway to show all these wonderful animals in all sorts of different poses which probably never happened but then again yeah. might, might yeah. still have because yeah. they are they are based on existing nature yeah so do you think the, the, the whole debate around feather, feathered dinosaurs also had, a, had sort of a prompt in, in, the, 
illustration community or or it has nothing to do with it it was no, already well, yeah, a, I think, a discussion I, I think it's one of the the elements of, of of greater diversity greater variety that you see the interesting about the addition of feathers is obviously that Color. the introduction of feathers into reconstruction happened mm. before feathers were actually found in dinosaurs oh yeah exactly so that oh, makes cool. it really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it's one of those cases where an assumption is confirmed by the evidence yeah. at a later point. Yeah. So, which I some, sometimes has led artists to sort of, yeah, um, go overboard a little bit. Sure. You know, you but then that's how you, that's basically how science works as well. You mm, yeah. How and then you get corrected if the evidence doesn't sustain your assumption or your yeah. hypothesis. Um, but we've certainly gone a lot farther than we have we had before. Yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, so so interesting. So, uh, just to finalize, I think uh, uh, just not to make it too long of a show here, uh, I would just um, would like to hear you also on the discussion of. So, Yekel is doing this sort of collection-based knowledge. This is like mm -hmm. so, something I'm very obsessive now about. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's this relationship with um, having a feeling for the reconstruction of the composition of an animal or this artistic work as he also mm -hmm. saw it, right? Um, helps and also understand better the physical physicality of the of the material culture of these of these bones and these fossils. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's true. yeah. So it's it's a very interesting. I think puts puts the paleontological specimen into a sort of a different category. I guess. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, I, uh, also, if it's, it's not just to know that Jack was also very in, in, interested in the physicality of of fossils as well. So, for instance, in the case of uh, these Neosaurus remains, his usual practice was if he went somewhere, he took a ball of what's called Pucuta Percha, mm -hmm. which is sort of a latex uh, derivative, mm -hmm. uh, which keeps it less. Well, some of I've, I've got a couple of his um, his old casts, and even after more than 100 years, they still retain a lot of their elasticity um, because you have to, you have yeah. to sort of push it in all sorts of little cranks and, hmm. uh, and creases Cranes, yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and he always made those to be able to handle them afterwards and look at them from uh, to, a point, to a point that the University of Graveshoff now sort of has a problem because they've got so many of them and you can't really throw it away either, you know. Um, mm. But it's, it's clearly, yeah, it, it, it's clear that he doesn't, he doesn't like to work from photographs because he thinks that it's too dim two dimensional yeah. and, and it doesn't lack this physical this physical presence that you really need to come to a proper understanding yeah. of any three dimensional fossil structure. Yeah. So, my God, this was so interesting, Ilya. I hope well, uh, we can uh, keep the discussion and definitely the the call was made to our colleagues in the archive in Lisbon. Um, I hope they can find uh, some some sort of uh, archival evidence mm -hmm. that Yekel was there or maybe at the Geological Museum. No. Um, and that would be really cool for the museum in Lisbon as well to, to learn more about its visitors. And um, not just because of that connection, but also for bringing us this really multi-dimensional aspect. Yeah, I hope it wasn't to... too multi-dimensional. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it was work in no. progress. I do understand that it, it needs to be rounded off a bit more, but it'll sure. all be in my biography. Exactly. Stay tuned to buy the new book by Ilya Neuland very soon. Yeah, but you can still buy the old one, by the way. Yes, please buy the old one as well and check it out in the in the links uh, here. And please remember to subscribe to uh, Munax, um, so to to the YouTube channel and uh, stick around also for next month's presentation a seminar, who's going to be uh, given by Bruno Martinho, and we are always always uh, looking forward to listen from him as well. So um, that's it from us. Bye-bye um, and see you next time. And thank you all also for the future comments that will eventually appear uh, is, since this YouTube video will, will stay uh, recorded and playing um, forever. Um, so <laughs> thank you again, Ilya, and uh, see you My all next, next month.
Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Um. So now, hopefully.